Hi, welcome back to Box Delights. Today I'm going to be playing a Euro's Euro. This is a very Euro game. It's called Merv, the Heart of the Silk Road. Designed by Fabio Lapiano, graphic design, artwork, you know, tools, published by Osprey Games. The game plays one to four. Yeah, this is a Euro with built in solo rules, and that's what I'm going to demo for you today. Merv is an ancient city near modern day Mary in Turkmenistan. On the board, we have a representation of the city of Merv, surrounded by these city walls. The game is set towards the end of the 12th century when the city was under Turkish rule. In 1221, the city was raided by the Mongol invaders, leading to the death of 700,000 inhabitants and the destruction of the dam that supplied the city with fresh water. The city, the game tells us, never fully recovered and by the 19th century was abandoned entirely. It's an interesting archaeological site because the city developed over many centuries. It was founded in the 6th century BC and has been ruled by many peoples at different times. Persians, Greeks, Turks, the Uzbeks, the Arabs and those invading Mongols. And interesting archaeologically because of the way the city built up. A lot of cities will be laid on top of each other. Merv was built in this ever-expanding way. So there's lots of cities next to each other. In the game, the city, this is this was me <laughs> completely playing a game and getting hammered by the solo game. So I've got a much better idea now about how I'm gonna how I'm gonna win. In the game, the city is made up of a five by five array of tiles. It's super, super interesting. It's a really neat mechanism. We're going to play the game over three years. Our aim is to, like in, in most Euros, come out with the most victory points at the end of the game. We've got a, a track around the edge to record our victory points. And in each year, we're going to be placing our action token, what they call the master meeple, on one of these sides of the cities. We're going to refer to them as rows throughout the game. But the side we place it on, each year is going to be four rounds. One, two, three, four, starting in the northwest of the city up here. In each round, we're going to be selecting an, a, an action from the row that we place our meeple in. So the grid of tiles creates this interesting tactical element to the game because only one player can select each row each round and your actions will be amplified by the buildings that have been placed here in rounds prior buildings placed by you or by other players okay so it creates this interesting tactical dimension to the game we're going to look at it as we as we learn to play we're going to set up the city in this random fashion so every time you play you get a different combination of city tiles in each row, creating this endless replayability. And in the centre of the city is this double-sided camel market, which performs different actions depending on which side it's on. So we'll just randomly pick a side and we're almost ready to start playing. Let me just take you to the game end and how we score those points. At the end of the game, you're going to be scored points based on these caravan cards. A caravan of camels. Each caravan card shows one of four different spices. We've got cinnamon, juniper, ginger and pepper. A set of four cards, one of each type of spice, is worth 10 points at the end of the game. A set of three, so any three different spices is worth six. A set of two would be worth three, and then one on its own, just one point. These caravan cards cost resource cubes. There's four types of resource cubes in the game. They don't specifically have a name, but they've got different colors. We've got orange, teal, tan, In this purple colour. The building sites in the city provide those four resources. 
And so if we look at a city tile, we can see this one here produces the burgundy cube and the purple cube. So we know we're going to be collecting resources to score end game points using those caravan cards. But that's not all. This game is multi-layered. There's lots of ways to score points. This is the year tracker here. And as I told you, it's three years in the game. At the end of each year, and there's an icon here to depict this, there's a scoring phase. So at the end of years one, two and three, a scoring phase, and then we do our end game scoring on caravans. In those scoring phase, and this is where you're going to pick up the bulk of your points, you're going to be scoring points from the palace. The palace will reward you for one point for every scroll, is another type of currency, each type of scroll that you have. One point for every spice, every caravan card you have. One point for every good that you have. There's different types of goods that you can pick up. We'll come to that in a second. And also one point for every point of progress you've made on this mosque track. So how do you get these things? There's six types of buildings in the city. Each tile has a different type of building. This one has walls. This one has the caravansary. This one has the library, for example. And what you'll notice on the board is there's six distinct areas. This is the palace. This is the mosque. This is the library. This is the market. This is the walls. This is the caravansary. Caravansary is where you go to pick up these caravan cards. And at the start of the game, we seed the board with these cards. So if we want to take the caravansary action, which is up here, we need to place our master meeple in a row in a, where there's a caravansary building to take an action on that site. Caravansary action. Okay, and then we can pay our cubes to buy these cards, right? That's the caravansary. If we take an action at a building site with a library, we can go to this area, collect scrolls, earn points for them. If we go to a building which has a mosque, like here, then we can start to progress our disc up this track. If we go to the market, we can trade resources, these cubes, for goods. And if we get goods, we get points. And if we build walls, we start to defend the city from the Mongol invasion. We'll come back to that in a second. And the difference with walls is there's no points awarded at the palace for walls. But walls protect the city and stop things getting destroyed. But they also progress a token that moves up this influence track. Now, the inference track does a couple of things. At the beginning of the game, you can only collect one type of spice. So maybe you'll decide you want to collect ginger. Okay. Now remember, we're trying to get sets. So that's not going to score you a lot of points at the end of the game if you're only collecting ginger. But on this track, at this point here, once we get enough influence, it says you can collect two different types of spices. So now we might collect ginger and cinnamon, or juniper and pepper. To collect three types of spices, we need to make it up to this point, and to collect four types of spices for maximum points, we need to make it up to this point. Placing and building walls is the easiest way of getting influence and pushing up this track. There's also some other numbers here. There's a one here, there's a two here, there's a three here. And that's because there's another way to spend our goods and our scrolls, the things that we earned from the library. To get scrolls you swap these cubes for scrolls. Right? So cubes are the basic raw material to all of these actions. We need it to buy scrolls, we need it to buy goods. We need it in fact to get up this mosque track and we need it to buy these caravan cards, okay, those spices. But we can also swap scrolls and goods, so that's these, 
goods that we earn at the market. For these contracts, we can fulfill contracts, and contracts give us points. However, this is a level three contract. It has a three in the bottom right. This is a level two contract. This is a level one contract. The higher level contracts give you more points, but you can't start fulfilling those until you hit these points. So that's a number one. So I have to get past or to this point before I can start fulfilling level one contracts, this point before I can start fulfilling level two contracts, and this point for level three contracts. Once I get up this far, remember building walls is the best way to get influence up this track, I start scoring victory points. Every time you see this sign, it's victory points. And then when you get to the end, this bit, this symbol here, this green turban, represents something called favour. This is the favour track. If I take an action at a city with the palace, like here's a palace on this city tile, then I can place one of our meeples, these are called servants, in the palace. Let's say I place a servant here in this part of the palace. This is called the Hall of Trade. I have to pay a cube. Again, everything costs these cubes, which remember come from your buildings. So for example, this building here will give you one of these tan cubes. I have to pay a cube, place a meeple, place a servant in the Hall of Trade, and then I can start scoring points for goods. Remember, these happen at these points at the end of every year. Okay. The problem is, in order to score your servants in these different halls, you need to pay favour. So if I wanted to score that one, I need to pay one favour. So my token needs to have progressed up this track. Incidentally, as you push your favour up, you score points at these different points, right? So this is 1.2 point, 2.3 point, 3 point, 4 point. If you reach this point, then it, instead of gaining more favour, you just gain more influence up on that track, okay? So you've got to push up this track, because I could have multiple servants in these different palace buildings. So if I wanted to, it, game scoring, if I wanted all three of these to score, then I'd have to pay one, two, three favour, one, two, three favour. How do you gain favour? Well, any time you see this turban icon is when you gain favour. So, for example, if I paid a cube, took the palace action at one of these building sites and placed a servant here, because it's got that green turban, I've gained one favour. Okay? There's lots of places around the map where you'll score favour. So, for example, there's favour here on the marketplace action. It has the tur turban icon, so you would gain a favour. Also, some of these caravan cards give you favour. So this one says, when you take this card, there's, there's an icon here that shows two cards, two juniper cards. If you have two juniper cards, gain a favour. Right, so there's different ways of gaining favour. This is the key to use scoring points here. There's another way, and we'll come to that in a minute, because in each scoring round, your score for the palace, so servants in the palace that you can pay favour for, there's also bonuses. For example, you'll score four points if your disc has managed to reach the top of the mosque track by taking actions at mosque buildings. There's also scoring tiles, which give you some bonuses during that end game. I'll show you that in a second. But you also score points for each building you have built in the city. And that's the thing we're going to come to next. Because we're going to start the game, and the first thing we're going to do on our turn is start placing buildings in the city to take actions and those buildings will score as points as long as they survive the Mongol invasions which happen in it, the end of years two and three before scoring. All right. Now we're playing the solo game there's one more thing we need to do before we can get going and that set up the solo AI deck. Here it is. The solo AI deck has six cards, one for each of these different types of actions you can take, right? Those six types of buildings, the ones we've just described. Okay, now the palace building's always got to be in there. So I'm going to grab that one, along with the green turban. But we've got to set this up kind of in a special way. We've got to stack this deck a little bit. 
we're going to take the palace card and we're going to shuffle it with a random two cards from the other five. Okay. Then we're going to take one of the other three, the remaining three, and place it on top. The other two go on the bottom. So we know that the palace card is in that middle three somewhere. Okay. The first action, the AI player, the AI player incidentally is called the corrupt magistrate. Okay. Corrupt magistrate. They're going to take an action. We know the first one they take is not going to be the palace action. In fact, it's going to set up the palace action in some way, but we'll come to that. Remember, they're looking to score points. I'm going to be the blue player, so I've got a set of discs, a set of buildings, and a set of meeples, and the master meeple, this big one. We're going to use a second colour for the corrupt magistrate. They also have the meeples, buildings, and discs of a second colour, so they're going to be red. And then we've got this third player. The third player is called the high courtier. The high courtier only has buildings. It's a passive player in the game. You also use this high courtier in a two-player game. And its pure objective is to block out buildings in the city, right? just to mix things up a little bit in a two-player and in a solo game. In a solo game, the corrupt magistrate is active and has some agency driven by this corrupt magistrate AI deck. Okay, cool. The corrupt magistrate always starts first. In each corner of the city, Remember, each year consists of four rounds. One, two, three, four. Okay, we're going to go around the track like this. In each corner is a queue. One, two, three, four. We don't use the four spot in a two, one, two, or three player game. We're going to use that in a four player game. But in each corner is a queue, and that determines the turn order for each round. I'm going to explain this when we get there. But you might have noticed dotted around the board are these camels, and camels help us manipulate the turn order. Now at the start of the game up in this northwest corner is the first queue. The corrupt magistrate starts the game first, we start second, and the high courtier starts third. So let's dive straight in. The corrupt magistrate goes first, they draw the top card and let's see what they're going to do. Okay, they're going to take the library action. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Library building. That's all we need to really look at right now. At the start of the game, with the city all empty, the logic for the corrupt magistrate in the solo game is pretty straightforward. They just want to take the rightmost because they want to get to the front of the queue. Because at the front of the queue, they'll be more likely to go first for the next round. Okay. So they're looking for the row that's got. A building site with a library action in it. So where is one? There's one right here. Okay, so they're going to place their meeple in this row. Okay, and there's one, two, five spots, one for each row. They're going to place it all the way down there. Bad luck on us. And they're going to look to take this action. Okay, the action for the library. Cool. Once you've placed your master meeple, if the building tile that you're taking your action on is empty, it is at the moment, at the start of the game everything's empty, you place one of your buildings, so this white building icon here, on that city tile. There it goes. Then you generate resources, so this one generates an orange cube. Now the corrupt magistrate and the high courtier, they don't ever take resources and they don't need to spend resources, so they ignore anything with a cube. Wow, that's a huge advantage to them. And we've got to compensate for that with our skillful play. And now they take the library action. Now this is important. They've got a building on the map. Remember, at the end of each year, there's going to be a scoring round. And I told you you're going to score primarily for the palace. Then some little bonuses like these bonuses here. Or if you've reached the very top of the mosque track. The third type of bonus is the number of buildings on the, on the map in the city. End of year scoring, every building is going to score you one point. Okay. At the end of years two and three, there's going to be a Mongol invasion. We won't see this at the end of year one. So you've got a little bit of time to establish some buildings. But the Mongols are going to attack every row from every side, from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west. This building is going to get destroyed unless it's protected by walls. 
So when they attack from this side, Mongol's going to hit the first two tiles. Okay. When they hit from this side, they're going to attack these two tiles. They attack from the west, they'll attack these two tiles, so these first two, and then from the north, these two tiles. So what you can see is this bottom corner here is going to be attacked from the south and from the east, but walls will protect it. So to protect this tile, it will need two walls, one from the south and one from the east. Okay, not from the west because it only attacks the first two, and not from the north, it only attacks the first two. So this tile is attacked from the south and from the east. You see these middle two here, they won't be attacked from the south because they're three rows up, they won't be attacked from the north, they're three rows down, but they will be attacked from the east. And they will need a gate, there's a gate icon here to protect them. Gates are more expensive than walls, all right? So buildings are vulnerable at the ends of years two and three to those Mongol attacks. If those buildings are removed, then they're not going to score you because they're gone. OK, so that's one thing to look out for. We've got to build walls to protect our buildings in order to score them in the scoring round. The other way to protect them is this little spot here is to place some soldiers here. OK, that means walls aren't necessary. That soldier is protecting them and it will fight the Mongols and get removed. The third way is to pay a bribe to the Mongols. If you pay the resource that this tile generates, this is generates an orange cube. When this building's attacked, if you pay an orange cube, you avoid losing your building. All right, so three ways to protect it. Walls, soldiers, pay a bribe. Save your points. More points for end of year scoring. <laughs> OK, I told you this game was multi-layered. But you can see cubes are becoming a real key point to this game. They underlie everything that you do here. Right, the arrow is going to do their thing now. They're going to take the library action. So library, it's really simple. Take the action. Normally, you would pay cubes. If you pay one cube, you get one scroll. If you pay two cubes, you get two, three, three, four, four. OK, scrolls. If you pay multiple cubes, they have to be different colors. Okay, One cube, one scroll, two different cubes two cubes, three different cubes, three scrolls. So if you pay two teal, that's still only one scroll. There is a wild card cube. There's a white cube. White can be any color, right? And there's different ways of getting these and I'll, I'll show you them when we, when we get to them. All right, so as it goes, Corrupt Magistrate doesn't have to pay cubes. It doesn't collect cubes, but when it takes the library action, it takes one scroll. Now this is important for the Corrupt Magistrate because it kind of sets their game up a little bit. Remember, end game scoring is mostly during the game is going to come from the palace. And we know that the palace action is in there now. It's either the second, third or fourth cards. And when they come to play the action, what they're going to do is going to go place one of their servants in the palace at the spot that generates them the most points. They're collecting scrolls so they might if it comes up now they might place a servant here that will score them scrolls so it could well be that i look for an opportunity to do that first that might be my plan okay and this is the thing that i've not been doing when i've been playing i've been kind of playing my own game and ignoring the corrupt magistrate so to place a servant here i need to take the palace action i need to play a purple cube or a burgundy cube right this one is the teal tan orange and then I can place my servant here that doesn't stop him there's two other spaces now I could fill those up with my servants which means there's no more room for other players or the corrupt magistrate could fill up with their servants but let's say I wanted to do that let's say I want to fill that spot so I need two things I need a building with the palace action and I need a purple cube. So let's have a look. It just so happens that there's a palace action here that generates a purple cube. There's a palace action below it that generates an orange cube, but that means I'm placing it in the wrong place. The downside is if I place my master meeple, so it's my turn, I get to place my meeple now. They've done their thing, right? They've placed their master, they've picked tile, they've taken the action, done. Now it's my go. So I could go here now. And if I go here and choose this one, that's cool. That does what I needed to do, but I'm at the back of the queue, which probably means I'm gonna go last on the next round. I won't get first pick. 
Now what you'll notice in this city, if we look for all the building tiles that generate purple, there's one, two, three, four, five, six of them, each for one of the six different actions. And the same applies to all the others. So that generates 24, and then we've got this middle one here, which we'll come to in a, in a little while. So we know that they're gonna exist, but they're gonna start filling up with buildings. So I'm gonna place my master meeple here. I'm gonna take a building. I'm gonna place it here because it's an empty site. Now, as the game goes on, we can take actions at sites that already have buildings on them, but we don't get to place a building. So place a building. This gives us one resource, one burgundy resource. Let's grab that from the supply. Place it in my play area. And now we take the action. Now this is where what we do is slightly different to the corrupt magistrate, slightly different to the solo AI. We've actually got three choices here. The first choice is we take the building action. So we take the palace action. The second choice is we deploy a soldier. So we could, instead of taking the palace action, we could place one of our soldiers here. Right? That's it, that would end our turn. The third option is we simply gain one favor. Okay, we push our token up the track. Remember, gaining favor means we can then activate these servants at year-end scoring and score those all-important points. Right? We need favor. Okay, but I've got nothing. I've got no servants in the palace right now. I don't want to do that. I could place a soldier and protect my building, but at the end of year one, there's no Mongol invasion, so I don't feel we need to do that right now. So. We're going to take the palace action. The palace action is pay the cost to place a servant. So I'm going to pay one burgundy cube, the cube I've just earned, and I'm going to place a servant in this hall here, the hall of knowledge. Okay, this is the hall of knowledge, and you points for scrolls, the hall of spice, and you points for caravan cards, the hall of trade points for goods, and the hall of faith points for pushing up the mosque track. Right, so we're going in the hall of knowledge. And the first person to place a servant in the hall, there's a turban icon, gains one favour. Great. So that means when we get to year-end scoring, I can spend one favour to make my servant score the points for scrolls, which I don't have. <laughs> so I might want to be taking the library action next. Okay, there's my spent burgundy cube. That goes back in the supply. Perfect. That's me done. Now it's the High Courtier's turn. A High Courtier is like this dummy player that just blocks up spaces. Now in a two-player game, whoever goes first is the person that places the High Courtier. And it's the same in the solo game. So the Corrupt Magistrate went first, so the Corrupt Magistrate will place the High Courtier. And there's logic that tells you where they will place it. They'll choose the row where we have the most buildings. Now, as it goes, there's only three rows they can place it in this action, active slot, this active slot, this active slot, where there's no buildings at all. So typically they'll want to place it here, but they can't. You can only place one master meeple in each slot. So what they'll do is they'll look for the row with the fewest of their buildings. Again, there's none because it's all empty at this point. In the case of a tie, which it is, they'll just place it at the spot closest to the queue that we've just left. OK, so they're just going to go in here. Remember, the Kai Courtier only has buildings. All they're doing is placing buildings. So now that they've selected a row, where do they place their building? They place it in the row, the perpendicular row, where we have the most buildings. They're going to place it here. This is the perpendicular row where we have the most buildings. It's the only row where we have buildings. Okay. Now, the reason why is during round two, let's say I put my action slot here, and I put... A blue, key, a blue building here because I'm taking an action here. When you take an action at a building site, right, I remember I told you it generates the resource, in this case a teal cube. It also generates a resource for every other building in that row that's the same colour. So there's a blue building here, I just placed it, but there's also a blue building here, I placed it on round one. So when I took this action, not only would I get a teal cube, I'd also get another burgundy cube. Right? This is the delight of this game. When you play, you're building at these perpendicular angles and kind of building up rows where you're trying to maximize your buildings. Because every time you 
activate that row, you gain resources for every building of your color. Now in a multiplayer game, this is really neat because you can, you know, maybe I want to take, I, I place my master meeple here and I want to take the mosque action. Well, it could be that there's other yellow buildings in this row. It's not just your color. So if I choose to activate this, I don't get to place a building because there's already one there, but I get a, a teal resource, um, a tan resource all the same, but I also get a resource for every other yellow building in the row. So I'd get a burgundy one and another tan one, right? It doesn't matter that they're not my buildings. Now, as it goes in the solo game, this plays slightly different. In the solo game, you can never activate the buildings of the corrupt magistrate. Right? So if there's a red one here, you couldn't take the mosque action on that row. You can activate the high courtiers just like you can in the two player game. But on the flip side, the corrupt magistrate will never activate our buildings either. So red buildings are out of bounds for me. Blue buildings are out of bounds for the corrupt magistrate. But yellow buildings, yeah, they're fair game. Now we've finished the round. We've all taken our three actions. It actually plays really quickly, but obviously I'm explaining things as we go. But now we need to queue up for round two. And we start from the back here. So I'm at the back here, so I'm gonna go in third place, then the hard courtier second, and then the corrupt magistrate first. You can manipulate this with camels, but we haven't collected any camels yet. We'll come to that soon enough. 